Hello and welcome everybody to the ABA Open Day. My name is Clemens Wasner from the nonprofit AI Austria and I'm the host of today's panel. Uh, with me on the panel, I welcome to my right hand side Tamara Gerbert, CTO and a founder, a co founder of Brightmind AI. Then the gentleman to her right is uh, Martin Herdina. He's a uh, senior XR at Qualcomm, before CEO and uh, one late co founder of Wikitude. Then to my left, uh, Thomas Moser. He's from Prewave, the head of AI. It's like a Series A startup, more to that later. And last but not least, the gentleman on my left is Florian Resch from ISD Cube, managing partner. Uh, before we dive into the, the different blocks, I would like to yeah, ask each of you to give a very brief uh, self-introduction of both yourself and the company, like two or three sentences maximum. So again, ladies first. Hello everyone, I'm Tamara Gerbert. I'm a neuroscientist by training, uh, then specialized in neurotechnology and AI technologies applied to neural data. Um, I, uh, Brightman AI is an early stage startup. We do non-invasive brain stimulation with closed loop neurotechnologies. So we record brain activity and respond personalized to recorded brain activity. And um, yeah, uh, and our first target market is migraine uh, or the prevention of migraine to be specific. Thank you very much. Then, yeah, let's continue with Martin from uh, Qualcomm. Yeah, thank you, Clemens. Yeah, hello, everybody. My name is Martin Herdina. Uh, I'm a senior director for XR at Qualcomm. So I've been in startups uh, my whole life for the past 20-something years. Um, uh, in For the past 10 years, I've been running a startup called Wikitude. Uh, we have been enabling uh, augmented reality applications for uh, quite successfully. And last year, uh, I've joined Qualcomm as part of an acquisition. And uh, now I'm running global business and partner management for uh, XR and our developer and partner uh, platform. OK, thank you. Then let's continue with Thomas. Yeah, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Thomas Moser. I'm the head of the data science uh, department at Prewave. Um, my background is in mathematical physics. And now I switched four years ago to Prewave. And in Prewave, we are trying to bring transparency to supply chains. We do this by detecting risks alongside the huge international supply chains and also by discovering what are actually the suppliers of our customers. Good, thank you. And then last but not least, Florian. Thanks. Yeah, hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. My name is Florian Resch. I'm one of the managing partners at ISD Cube. We are an early stage venture fund um, currently investing out of a 45 million fund dedicated to early stage um, academic spin offs and founders coming out of university, coming out of scientific institutions. We like to partner early with our companies, um, oftentimes in the first funding round that they do, sometimes also um, even as a founding investor in some cases. Um, we typically do that in, in three categories. The one is life sciences, the other one is what we call advanced materials, and the third one relevant for today, I think, is the computer science spectrum. And what's especially interesting and relevant for us, I think, is where AI as a horizontal technology can kind of influence and thrive and um, boost developments in other scientific areas. Thank you very much. You already provided the right keyword. Uh, we would like to make the first round to discuss a little bit about the Austrian AI ecosystem. Uh, this is, I think, now the, the third time that at the ABA Open Day we introduced the Austrian AI ecosystem. And from our experience, there, was, there were also lots of requests uh, following up the event from companies that are interested in opening up a company in Austria and how the ecosystem works, like who are the players, who are the investors and so on. Uh, and yeah, I would like to, to start this round now with you, Martin, because as you mentioned, you have been uh, as I say, around for quite a while, especially back then with, with Wikitude. Uh, how did you experience the, the build up and the growth of the, of the ecosystem, both from an XR perspective, perspective and also computer vision and AI? Uh, well, um, I didn't found Wikitude. I joined Wikitude in 2010 when it was like one year old. Um, our founder actually was the one creating the first ever created uh, augmented reality application on an Android smartphone. And uh, from a computer science, computer vision standpoint, it was very, uh, very rudimentary, which is like placing content on top of a geo coordinate. So we've been using that for traveling tourism applications, for treasure hunts and things like that. Um, zooming, zooming out a bit. So um, 
this whole space was like pretty much a uh, following the hype cycle uh, that you might know from Gartner. So really being hyped extremely in 2010 when I joined the company, everybody was talking about AI, AR, uh, Wikitude. We, we have been like on top of the Economist magazine. So um, somebody claimed like the future leading platforms uh, globally is going to be uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google, and Wikitude. And uh, history turned out a bit differently. But um, as, as mentioned, so uh, the hype was huge, um, but technology wasn't there. And then uh, in the following one, two, three years, we really kind of fell down brutally. So uh, it really kind of uh, took, a while, took a while to recover. Uh, we had to really kind of focus on what, what uh, the value we could create. We had to focus on the business case. We had to focus on the end customer. Uh, we changed business model from an end customer application to an enabling application. And uh, since doing that, things uh, uh, have been going quite well. And we've been like enabling AR then for almost a decade and uh, had like fantastic customers and partners. And uh, since last year, we joined the Qualcomm family, still doing what we used to do. We enable AR, XR applications uh, for a global uh, user base, uh, but of course optimized for uh, uh, forward-looking devices, for headward devices, for VR devices, something very exciting. So this means this allows us to kind of keep doing what we are, what we used to do, but like just in like a very kind of uh, powerful and exciting environment uh, within Qualcomm. Thank you very much. That is very, very insightful. It's also very rare that you see someone that already lived through the entire hype cycle once and then still makes a very successful exit mm -hmm. to one huge technology company. So. Yeah, if we switch sides, literally and figuratively, how did you uh, experience the development of the of the ecosystem from an investor's perspective? I think Martin provided some some very good hints on that, and I think what we saw in general is a professionalization of the ecosystem um, over the last 10, 12 years, especially in Austria, um, driven by successful entrepreneurs, by successful um, founders contributing to the ecosystem by different ecosystem players, giving um, more feedback, more input to the ecosystem, national investors, but also international investors coming to the market and um, finding an attractive place here in Austria. And I think that's, that's the general perspective on um, how I perceive the, the ecosystem here in Austria. Um, specifically, I think in terms of deal flow, um, we see certainly very interesting stuff happening in Austria. So we're very, um, very optimistic and very um, positive on, on the developments here, once again. So Clemens, you're preparing the AI landscape for a couple of years. How do you see the developments from, from your perspective? Uh, let's say, I mean, of course, there, 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 there are lots of things you could discuss. I think most notably, you nowadays have more than 150 startups operating in the AI space. So this is constantly increasing. What is perhaps important to note that uh, unlike most other countries, you don't have, let's say, startup attrition. So it's very few companies went out of business in the last five years since we started with this whole thing. Uh, what is equally interesting, uh, you have lots of large international players coming here. I mean, one of them is here on the stage with us. It's like Qualcomm decided to do XR here. But you also have this in other areas. You have this with drone navigation, Amazon. You have this with mobile mapping, Meta is here, and so on and so on. So you could say that the ecosystem is maturing both on the startup side and on the corporate side, but especially also on the international player side. So all, all in all, it's, it's very good news. Uh, this brings me now to the, to the, to the second part of today's panel, uh, which is uh, like this, the state of AI, both from a technology and a regulation perspective. Uh, Picking up on the on the last topic, I mean, one of the most important developments of the last 18 months is the European AI Act. And I would now li like to ask s some of you from, from the panel, what is your experience? How does the AI Act, do you, do you perceive it as a, let's say, as, a, as holding your business back or is it even potentially a boost for your business? So here I would like to start with, with you, Thomas, because at Prewave, of course, you're very reliant on external data, on web crawlers or social media data and so on. So how does the European AI Act in its current implementation affect you? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say knowing from the data science point of view what is possible, I actually uh, very much appreciate it. <laughs> and also as a company for us, the, the ethical treatment of AI was always very, very important. And in general, we always try to bring transparency and make things better for, for people. And we mostly rely on very public information. So we are not really 
um, using private people information or something like this. So I don't think it will really affect us that strongly. Um, but I, I think knowing what is possible, I think it's really good that there is something happening because if you look at certain countries like China and what is happening, <laughs> Um, there, there you can see what, what can go wrong. Yeah. And is this, if I may have a follow-up question, is this also something that your clients are asking how you're dealing with, with this type of data? What are you, are you, if you're following the GDPR and so on? Uh, yes, I would say respectively much more than I would have expected maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's also because we do a lot of sustainability analysis. And of course, if you take talk to people from sustainability departments, they maybe have also a few on this topic. So I think from this perspective, there's actually a lot of discussion, but it's also a very internal discussion because it's something we really want to achieve too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because maybe two, two cents from my side, uh, when the whole discussion started, it was almost exactly two years ago that the first drafts were circulating of the AI Act. There was like the anonymous, uh, let's say, opinion that this will be a big hindrance for the ecosystem in, in entire of Europe. What we see most recently is that uh, many economies are following this type of regulation. So, for example, in India is working on something very similar and Japan as well. And uh, it was just last summer that a couple of Japanese corporates, for example, were taking a tour throughout Europe because they wanted to prepare for a similar regulation in, in Japan. And they wanted to have a look how our startups and corporates are dealing in Europe with it. So you, you could say from that perspective, it's because you mentioned sustainability, it's comparable to environmental regulation. This can also become an advantage. But yeah, but maybe my, my view is too positive. How, how do you perceive this in your portfolio companies? Well, I would agree. I think um, regulation in general can be something that, that provides a certain moat around the company. Um, if you think about geopolitical um, developments, if you think about international startups, companies competing on, on a global scale, I think that can be a certain advantage to, to European companies in that case. I think more globally, the EU in general needs to, needs to be careful to balance that, right? So this is still a geo, um, geographical um, discussion around the globe that, that's happening um, and to create something that can be a role model, but also something that is not hindering um, European companies in their, in their development, I think is important to balance those kind of um, aspects in, in, in thinking about regulations and, and laws in general. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, when it comes to regulation, uh, question to you, Tamara, because uh, I remember when I discussed with your co-founder and, and with both of you in the preparation, the, the two of you had a very hard look, where should you open up your company? More to that later, but coming from the regulation perspective, was this also a factor that you sooner or later realized would not become a problem in the long term or was the AI act a non-topic at all? So, I mean, we're, we're a medical class two device, so we have to go through the medical approval anyways. Um, there we have to say we're setting things up so that we can get approval in US and in Europe at the same time. And, uh, and our focus is actually US because um, it takes less time. So the FDA um, can guarantee things in, in six months. That takes one and a half years here. So our go-to market strategy is actually to start in US and then um, Europe. But uh, we, we don't see it as a, as a hindrance. Um, it's just one more thing to look out for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good in the medical space, that's true. This is like if you have so many reg regulations to follow, then AI is like two centimeters on top. Something like that, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Now, to, to not be too one-sided uh, uh, and just talking about regulation, I would also look, like to talk about the most recent trends and developments. I mean, one of them is looking directly into my face at the moment. It's metaverse. This is like all over the place since since 12 months. So uh, how do you uh, experience or, or tell us a little bit about the most recent developments in the metaverse space? And if you also think that it's still an area that is attractive for startups or is it like, you know, a large corporate topic only nowadays? Um, so Qualcomm calls uh, itself the ticket to the metaverse. Um, Martin personally doesn't like the term metaverse at all. So uh, in my previous life, I have been working in a virtual world startup and we have been dealing with Second Life and this was like mm. 2007 and uh, and again we we fell down very hard uh, <laughs> that kind of hype cycle uh, from the top to the bottom uh, still having said that I think I don't like the term metaverse but I think what's going on there is super exciting so um, 
Qualcomm is heavily uh, involved in pretty much all development there, ranging from VR, uh, uh, going on to, on to AR. Um, a new trend next year will be MR, meaning like VR devices with a video path through. Um, the exciting part is like um, everybody was kind of uh, talking VR down, but, but so far it's really successful. So there are a lot of, lot of people using, using uh, uh, VR devices these days. Uh, trend is, uh, is showing upwards very, very, very quickly. Um, having said that, there are many kind of special purpose devices coming out. There are kind of health tech devices like VR for therapy, um, VR for, for training purposes. Uh, also AR devices are, are moving to a very uh, specific special interest purposes. So uh, it's pretty exciting what's, what's going to be there. Still, uh, when I look at it like your face, so, so um, we're still a few weeks away until, until we're going to have like end user uh, uh, AR glasses on our faces. Um, but yeah, in parallel, there are now, now developments about kind of AR uh, contact lenses and actually try them on. It's pretty exciting already. So uh, yeah, definitely a very exciting development happening. Uh, I wouldn't call them metaverse, but uh, still like very exciting use cases that, that are being created in this environment. Okay, thank you. So it's a good story for startups and it's an even better story from a bank account because the consumer devices are still a couple of years away. Mm -hmm. So uh, last but not least, uh, what are the recent developments in your area? Because it's like natural language processing, uh, semantic uh, segmentation and so on. So how do you see what's like the next wave of better understanding data that is crawled from the web? Yeah, I think in the last years there were amazing progress in this natural language processing. Really where certain type of tasks were first time really better than humans. And that's really also what you notice in, in working with the data that it's really hard to verify things by now with humans because actually the model gets better than the humans. So it gets harder and harder in this sense, in a positive way. Uh, there are these very big models you get over the news, the GDP, uh, GPT-3 uh, model and, and, and so on. Um, there's really, they are really good um, and, and gigantic models. So from a business point of view, not easy to host. But um, yeah, I think even if you just take smaller, more specialized models, you can do amazing things these days. So it's a really great time. And also for startups and founders everywhere, it's just a time where the progress in these, in these technologies are so much faster than actually businesses can follow up and producing solutions. So if you just sit down, there are so many ways of how you can improve things here that I think there will be much more to come. Thank you. I would agree. And if you look back the last couple of weeks, right, I, I mean, you could even see something like a Cambrian explosion with all this GPT-3 and, and stable diffusion models and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's that's not years, that's not decades, that's not weeks, that's days, mm -hmm. basically, where stuff is happening, right? And um, that can be, I mean, also to, to your point of, of the metaverse or um, other words you want to call this, I think this can be something that's very significantly contributing to, to asset generation in that space, right? So infrastructure, um, but also integration of, I don't know, um, additional senses, if you will, not only optical or, or visual senses, but also touch and feel, um, noise, hearing, um, all this kind of things. So I think this is a very exciting space. And I think there are a lot of developments where, where these big models actually contribute a lot. Yeah, this is a very interesting example because Martin mentioned The Economist before and just before summer, The Economist had a feature on these very large models like DAL-E2 and GPT-3 is like, like text generation or image generation. And their thesis was that the large models will become future platforms and it's like a winner takes all effect. You have to license these platforms just two months later, so less than two months, six weeks later, you have stable diffusion, which is uh, image generation. Uh, you can download it for free, dear audience, and it, it's, it's, it's an open source project. And this is quite remarkable because for, for OpenAI and DALL-E, there was a huge waiting list. People were waiting there for like half a year and longer, and now it's out in the public. And you have this for GPT-3 for GPT or X with, with language, with generation and so on. So it's really a democratization. And not only in that, in that space, I think also in, in biology, for example, right? So if you think about what AlphaFold um, just published with, I don't know, 200 million um, protein structures, right? So that's basically putting uh, 3D modeling of almost any protein right at the fingertips in, in something like a Google search, um, literally, right? So that's yeah. that, that's super interesting, I think. 
there's even language models now that are looking at um, DNA data. And I think it's an interesting uh, example because you have, you're trying to analyze something with an AI model that you don't understand yourself. So unlike normal language, we don't understand DNA language. So it's, um, I think it's a really exciting opportunity for us also to understand DNA better, um, to leverage these language models for and biological data. Yes, it's exciting times for AI, but why is it exciting times for Austrian AI? I would like to, to discuss this with you in the third round now. Uh, this is like, yeah, why, why should you open a company in Austria? But before I ask uh, Tamara why you should open a company in Austria, I would like to ask Martin, why do you keep a company in Austria even post-exit? Because this is an equally, let's say, interesting story. So what were the driving factors for Qualcomm to, to keep the team here? Uh, because it's also something we see from other companies. I mentioned Amazon and, and, and Meta before. Uh, also, also Snap, for example, Snap, Snap, the, the, the makers of Snapchat, they, they also have their computer vision team here in Austria. Yeah, true, and we, we know them uh, quite well. So, so Snap and Qualcomm are very, very good partners. Um, having said that, uh, we don't just keep the team here, here we expand the team uh, significantly. So I think we almost doubled the team since uh, we joined Qualcomm like, uh, like last year. Um, also, Qualcomm even kind of established what's called like XR Labs Europe. So it's like a pan-European initiative, really kind of having R&D for XR focused uh, within Europe. So we have uh, R&D centers in five cities in Europe, but like the biggest uh, R&D uh, group is here in Austria, in Salzburg and Vienna. And um, yeah, so on, on one hand, we had like uh, uh, the competency from 10 years of, of XR. So there's something uh, that's very rare in the industry. Uh, aside from that, um, um, we like being in Austria, so 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 we 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 find good people here. We find high high quality resources here. Uh, we have people uh, from abroad move to Austria. They they like the quality of living here. Um, we work very closely with the universities, so so that's the thing from a research standpoint, from a recruiting standpoint. So we support many PhD programs, uh, and then kind of try to to recruit PhDs uh, onto the team for our our uh, compute division and and perception team. So, so overall, it's like a very fruitful environment for us uh, in terms of like specifically uh, human resource capital and kind of uh, quality of living. Mm, thank you very much. So now, finally, uh, I, I teased it uh, a couple of times already. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit what were the, the, the thoughts behind from you and your co-founder to open the company in, in Austria? Because you basically really had a global viewpoint, like what were the, pull fact the main pull factors? Of course. So yeah, for me, um, before I founded the company, it was not clear at all that I would go to Austria. I was in London and the Bay Area before. Um, and it uh, it seems like a great place to start. So there are a few factors that um, convinced us. I mean, we had an amazing um, VC backing us with IST Cube. Um, but I think the biggest point that convinced us to come to Austria was that uh, the funding opportunities here are the most are the strongest. So you can get up to a few million um, as an early stage startup here that is um, particularly relevant to med tech because uh, it takes quite a, it's quite capital intensive to have a product that's um, ready for market. So that was, I mean, that for example was stronger even than in, um, in Germany or in, uh, in uh, the rest of Europe um, as an opportunity. And there it's in particular the IBS and the FFG that have great programs. And then apart from that, uh, high living standards, I mean, basically what uh, what you touched upon, right? So you have great living standards, you attract international team um, from our team and the people we're recruiting right now. Almost none are actually Austrian, so they're all migrating from different areas. Um, we have a great scientific ecosystem with the ISTA and the TU Vienna. And uh, yeah, and, it's, and because you're in a small country, it's much easier to have visibility. So, um, the network is together. We have uh, an exciting neuroscience community as well. And so it's a great place to start. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, just for the, ju just one thing to add, because you mentioned funding a couple of times. Uh, what you meant with AWS and FFG is like public funding. Yes. It's like grants. Yes. They, are very, they can be very large. And this is also one uh, specific agenda point for the ABA Open Day. So stay tuned. More, more to that, not from us, but from real uh, public funding experts. Uh, yeah, thinking of pull factors and so on. Yeah, uh, I would like to conclude this round by asking you, Thomas, because uh, 
let's say being a large company here that's one part coming here especially with the with the tailwind of having the government grants that's another thing but how easy or slash difficult is it to scale really a series a company like you're doing because you're like it's like a cambrian explosion you go from 15 people to 50 or 60. how how, how difficult 70 by now so it's, yeah, <laughs> it, goes, it goes fast um yeah it's it's quite a challenge um it's, I, I can just agree with what you said, Martin, is it's, uh, Vienna is a great city and we actually attract a lot of international people who come to Vienna and in, in the startup atmosphere, we can really offer them a great place to work where they can really flourish. So I think that's it's really a, a bonus you have that that's also Vienna and Austria, it's, it's quite international being also a smaller country. Um, of course, we, yeah, as I said, we have so many nationalities in our team. Um, we try to hire the best people we can get. Uh, some people you also have to hire from abroad, but that's usually also no problem. Uh, so I think these things really help us to scale our team to what, where we are now. And uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, exciting times. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I still remember the first time I met your co-founders. It was like three years ago. That it was a two-person company. So now, now it's seventy. This is mind mind-blowing story. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's really exciting. Maybe to add a quick data point on on that. Um, this summer we did a survey throughout our portfolio of, of fourteen companies now, um, pre-wave context flow, Nista, and, and others included in that. And what we found out is that we have over 70% of international employees in, in those companies and uh, over 30 nationalities, actually. So that was really surprising. And I think that speaks to, to what you just said. Um, still, I think there are certain topics that need improvement, right? So just think about the red, white, red card. Think about employee incentive plans and all these kind of demands that are on the table for I don't know how long now. Um, so we can do better and, and we should do better, but I think um, in general, it's it's an exciting place to to join a startup or to found a startup. Absolutely. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. I spent more than 10 years in East Asia. I was living for seven years in Tokyo and three years in Beijing, but uh, at the end also decided to open a company here. It's, it's, it's nice and you meet nice people. So win-win-win. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the final round, let's say, uh, we talked a lot about your success stories and so on, or what is, let's say, how is it to open a company in Austria and so on. Uh, I would now ask each of you to give one direct recommendation to the audience, because there are many people joining us today which have similar thoughts. Should they open a shop in Austria or should it be, let's say, a branch office and so on? What would be your recommendations to those that would like to open a company here? So let's start with Tamara. Well, I would definitely say uh, do it. Um, I think there are too few people with entrepreneurial ambition um, and uh, and they should definitely make be best use of the public funding that exists. Uh, and yeah. Martin? My biggest point is actually um, after funding uh, to think big. So that sometimes um, what uh, so Austria is a we keep referring to the small country uh, I think already five times today uh, but yeah uh, we're a we're in a, in a on a on a in a, on a global scale and um, you have to go out you have to meet people you have to partner and and, uh, and leave the borders and uh, just looking at, at Tamara and Thomas it's, it's it's exciting how how big you, you can you, you can grow and be and therefore so uh, thinking big I think that's really important uh, as a startup when you want to take the next step. Thank you. So what does the Series A company recommend? Yeah, I think I want to say what I said also earlier. It's such a good time to really go with this technology and then found a new company because there's so much to do. And uh, I think what I want to say maybe to as soon as you started a company to uh, kind of find, not give up and find the right um, place for your solution. So it's also always a bit of experimenting to find the right market and so on. So if you, I think there's so much to do. If you find a good product, you find a good market. Uh, there's a lot to achieve these days. Thank you. And last but not least, famous last words, Florian. <laughs> I can only agree to, to what the panel says so far. I think um, we typically like to partner with scientists wanting to become entrepreneurs or future entrepreneurs from the scientific space. Um, and I think Great companies in that R&D heavy science backed um, industries and, and developments, I think, can be founded at all times. And I think we are in a very exciting time. Cambrian explosion was, was a word we used um, twice, I think, today. So um, be brave, go out, do it. Um, 
we are here to support you as well on this first um, steps to your entrepreneurial road. Um, come talk to us and go get it done. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. This also brings us to the end of the panel. I, I hope in the last 30 to 40 minutes we were able to, let's say, pack your, pack your interest uh, in coming to Austria. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to the ABA, obviously. Uh, but uh, you also got our names now, so you just try to ping us on LinkedIn or whatever platform if you have any specific questions regarding investments, neuroscience and, and so on. So without further ado, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the event.